And I thought um, for this first meeting, we would mo mostly be talking at a high level of um, well, what what kind of um, what kind of questions we might ask using natural language processing for something we call sentiment analysis. And then next time we'll dig a little deeper into the de details and um, I might, may introduce. Um, I think I would be able to introduce um, machine learning and, and deep learning for sentiment analysis in an example next time. <clears throat> so here's what we'll get mostly through today. Um, I'm going to make some specific remarks about the uh, Python environment. I'm going to um, introduce the idea of what we call NLP, natural language processing. We've, we have talked in these meetings, it's been a while back now, but we have talked before about computer vision and um, how computers these days, we train models to classify and detect um, um, aspects of features that are just in video or, or pictures. And natural language process, um, processing, NLP, is um, related to those models, but the data are fundamentally different. The data are, um, are um, sequences of, of information. Now, the information might be text, it might be sound. Uh, if it's like what we're going to look at today in our example, it's, it's human written text and it has context. But it, it can be used for other things as well. We'll explore a few of those. I'm going to introduce a particular data set that's a, that is like a, um, if I say this is the hello world of um, natural language processing, some of you will know what I mean by that, but um, this is the very first real example with a substantial data set that it's very popular to use as a first example because it's a it's a very relatable data set. It's a, it's a tame data set. It's freely available. So we'll talk about that. A word cloud. We've seen them. There are lots of there is a lot of software that will create a word cloud, but um, a lot of times when I observed the word cloud, when they first came out, they were mind blowing, mind blowing, these word clouds, because they were automated and they were so cool and they are quite powerful. I do think that they're quite powerful when they're used in a powerful way, but we're going to be doing something different today rather than having an app that just flops out a word cloud with some text that we give to it. Um, we're, we're actually going to make a real word cloud with from first principles today using um, a, a Python library. I did have trouble doing this and I, I wasn't able to make all the word clouds my heart desired for this example, but I think we will be able to make one successfully. <laughs> um, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what sentiment uh, means and what sentiment analysis is, and that's about all we'll be able to get through today, I think. So that's what we're going to do. Now, if you want to follow along, I did pip in that um, in that email. Let me go ahead and submit this, and it'll look better. There we go. That looks a lot better. Um, I did tip the hat towards this uh, Jupyter standalone app, and um, to I was making some remarks before we started the meeting by way of uh, saying some problems that I had this afternoon with the uh, Python environment. My problem stemmed from the fact that uh, usually when I have a computer, I like to reinstall the operating system about every year at most, but even every six months, it's fun to reinstall the operating system because it just gives me a chance to clean everything out, set up everything exactly like I want it. The stuff I haven't used in a while, I don't have to reinstall. The stuff I'm using all the time, I get the latest version. Uh, and I and I can I can save a snapshot of my old system just in case I mess anything up. I can always go back to it. I have worked that way for years, but under lockdown, I, I haven't worked like that. And I set up this environment on the computer I was using today in my office um, almost three years ago now from scratch and um, over that period of uh, months and years since then it's mutated because I love to install uninstall and reinstall and I love to tweak 
everything about the software that I use. And I've been, I have been using Python a little bit, um, and I used it before the lockdown and since on this computer. What I found was that um, things changed so fast that um, I had several parallel environments set up on my local computer. I was, I was determined to use this Jupyter standalone app. I, I do really like it, and I do think it's really good at, at doing some things, and it, it probably is, um, I think it is probably the best if you only want to do simple things and you want to learn the basics of Python. I think it probably is the easiest for new users. But for beginners, and by beginner, I mean anybody who is um, not experienced or confident at setting up a programming language environment on your own computer, like if you haven't done it before, or if it's mysterious to you, or I might also classify a beginner as um, somebody who's never used Linux before. A lot of these tools are native in uh, the Linux operating system, which is um, quite similar in almost every way to Macs and Windows, but those few ways it's not similar are very important. And um, so if you if you haven't done that and you're not confident, I would probably, I would probably say that I'm speaking to you. And also, um, if you're not um, confident or experienced at managing um, files with the command line, um, on those on the basis of those criteria, I would say my current thinking is whoops. My current thinking is that in order of, from easiest to hardest, that uh, the Anaconda um, environment manager, it's a piece of software that installs Python. It installs a lot of libraries for you. It installs R as well by default, and it installs um, some graphical user interfaces that, that are equivalent to R Studio, and it also in installs several to give you a choice. Because it does all of those things for you, and also because it has a graphic user interface for, uh, I'll just show you mine. Um, I don't have to describe it. I'll actually show you in just a moment. Here's what the um, Anaconda startup screen looks like, and it's got um, all of these little apps that you might use. and when you install it, if I want to use Jupyter Lab, I use this as a launch for the Jupyter Lab. But there's a thing that it does behind the scenes that I was just referring to. And if we click over here on environments, it allows you to um, to set up several different environments. If I just um, click on some of these ones, it uh, it has several installed for us by default, and it's the base one the root one, that um, it, it's probably all you'll ever need. And uh, it, like our studio, has a graphical account of the packages that you have. And because it's been curated for you, they all just work. And uh, you can, if you don't like the command line, at least when you start, you will need to learn it to become proficient. But um, you can search for packages that you want or need and see visually if you've downloaded them locally, just like you can in our studio. And there may be some other environments in Python that allow you to do that, but I don't know about them if there are. And this one is certainly the most popular one. So I myself had a problem with the Python environment this afternoon, and I found that my old installation of Anaconda was not suited to, um, it was not up to date for the stuff that I that I had, and and neither was the standalone Jupyter Labs app, and um, I went and just said, okay, I'll use Colab, but that also had some overhead to file management, and so I just I came back to Anaconda, and it has contributed to my thinking, <laughs> uh, confirmed it to me that I think Anaconda is is the easiest for beginners. Colab is probably the next easiest because it is it doesn't give you any control over the environment or at least not very much you can install some things but it it picks where you install them from and has a default that you can't change as far as i know the jupyter lab standalone is very easy to start using it's probably the easiest of all of these if if you only want to learn the basics of python and and do really really basic stuff but i don't think it's as easy as um 
as the others because uh, you do have to manage your your own environment there and so you need a little experience probably to do something more advanced with that and, you know of course there are all the other methods you could um, python comes with actually a pretty good little editor i think it's called idle um, and you can set up python in many many other ways to use local on your computer but um, this is my current thinking for what's the easiest uh, anaconda is all local just does everything for you okay so <clears throat> what I have is um, some code in this that we're just going to run through. I'll talk you through the things that uh, I've attempted to do here. Um, I notice on a lot of these Colab notebooks that there's a practice that I really dislike a lot. And the practice is to, um, to and maybe it's a style thing, I don't know, but the practice is to... Um, to have the um, dependencies and the imports littered through these tutorials. And it, it may be because some of the tutorials are just made by students that are themselves learning, but it just drives me crazy. So I've, I've tried to put all of the imports up here at the top. <clears throat> We've used Pandas before. It has uh, data set reading tools and some analysis and statistics tools in it. We've used matplotlib before. It's one of the major um, graphics subsystems in Python to make to make graphs. We've used Seaborn before. Now Seaborn is is another major graphics system in Python. I'm I'm not sure that I did use um, the um, Seaborn in the end, and I uh, loaded up a palette which I didn't use in the end. This command we've also used before is to um, in a in a notebook environment like this it um, allows you to uh, display a plot right in line in a markdown document which um, which these ipython notebooks are comprised of um, now i think i had a i think i had one of my first problems with plotly um, we've used we definitely have used Plotly in R. It's an open source, also an open source graphics system um, that exists in Python and in, in R. It's very popular in R because it makes interactive graphs. And I think I just, um, I think I was having some trouble and I think I bypassed it, but I, I went ahead and I did successfully get it installed on my, my local system um, after I abandoned the standalone um, Jupyter Lab. So um, all of this stuff should just install. Let's just make sure of it, or should just import because it's already installed. And if I wanted to double check that it's installed, I, I could go look in Anaconda and I could install it right there um, on that graphical um, uh, interface, but uh, I probably wouldn't do that. I probably would, probably would install it with a command and uh, with with just a, a single unified Python environment that I know was launched from inside my Anaconda, I could I could install it from the, the command line here. I could just bring up a command line. Um, let me see, new launcher. I could just bring up a, a console and install it from here. Um, one of the differences between Python and um, an, yet another difference between Python and say R, which we talk about a lot, is that um, you have a lot more choice of repositories. In R, you either you're either in the single approved repository, CRAN, Comprehensive R Archive Network, and anything that you download installs from CRAN. Uh, or if it's outside CRAN, it might be on somebody's GitHub page, and then you have to manually install it. But in in this world, in the Anaconda environment, um, they also have a a um, a uh, prescribed um, repository that has all of the the uh, packages that you might download that they have curated for um, for the version that, that you have. But you can also import them from other repositories, and there are big there are a big number of um, Python repositories. Conda is the one for Anaconda. 
PIP is the one that we might use and we have used on um, co on Google Colab. And there are actually others and there are different versions of Conda and PIP as well. OK, so um, if we go back to our one there, that all installed, that's fine. And uh, we will also need this um, NLTK package. It's the um, Natural Language Toolkit, and it's one of the big ones. And um, from that, we're going to import what are called stop words. I'm not going to go through the theory of this, but um, the uh, we'll just briefly say in passing that <clears throat> when we uh, there are some words um, that I think are jargon terms that are associated with sentiment analysis and NLT, uh, uh, NLP. One of them that I just love is called corpus. What the corpus refers to is just a um, a uh, data set, basically uh, comprised of words. It could be the play Hamlet. It could be um, it could be wine reviews. It could be movie film reviews from Netflix. Um, and the one that we're going to download today is a collection of um, comments that review Amazon um, Amazon products. Now, stop words uh, are are words that are in the corpus that um, are um, words that we tend not to want to analyze, and they'll they'll tend to be very very common words like prepositions, like in or um, the or a or at, um, ones that are very common and don't have a lot of meaning with respect to sentiment, and so. Uh, for any corpus, one of the steps that we have to do is to remove the stop words. And um, to do this kind of uh, work, again, I'll just say this in passing, and maybe we'll we'll tittle with it a little bit more next week. <clears throat> is that um, that <clears throat> models that we might make to analyze um, particular things are specific to, um, for example, different human languages. Um, and the stop words, therefore, the dictionary of stop words that we would want to remove from our corpus are also specific to language. They're not just specific to language. I understand that um, people that are linguists, this is a powerful tool for people who study um, human language, that uh, different dialects of the same language also uh, have unique properties. And for example, um, one of the... Um, one of the natural language processing models in deep learning, which we may we may touch on next week, um, is uh, is based on the American version of English, very very far from the English version of English, according to most English people. Whereas there is also an English version of the English um, uh, deep learning model for natural language processing. So these things matter. So that we we have some generic stop words for English that we're going to download from this uh, this um, package called Corpus that's part of the NLTK, and then um, we're going to import from Word Cloud uh, stop words for Word Cloud. I can't remember if I ended up using this, but it's two different kinds of stop words. I think one of them may have failed. Saving complete and we're idle. Good. So that basically sets us all up. So now, um, <clears throat> it's just by way of a very small uh, introduction, there's this thing called sentiment analysis. It's used actually for a lot of things, and you've probably already encountered it as a subject today, probably many times. Uh, it's extremely common um, these days. It's used for um, for uh, feedback from consumers. It's used by companies. Um, in fact, one could probably say in the broad sense, it's uh, the biggest creator of, of wealth for companies like um, uh, advertising companies like Google, like Google AdWords. Um, it's also used for uh, surveys. So we might, um, we might say in the National Student Survey, I, I had an aspiration at one point uh, three, four, five years ago when I was working on the National Student Survey here in England, 
um, and I was heading a project that um, was analyzing all the data for the previous 10 years uh, of the National Student Survey. And they, the people I was working with were, um, they were, I wanted to do really fancy stuff with the data basically. And they were only interested in really the most boring things. So I, I did the boring things and I had aspirations to do natural language processing and sentiment analysis on the free responses in that data set. What I was interested in, uh, to give you an example of a research question, was student. What we what I found in a couple of um, couple of outputs from that that project were that uh, students will um, criticize certain aspects of their experience at the university, like they will criticize um, perceived um, perceived organization. Uh, and so they, the National Student Survey, many of you may have even taken it. There's a postgraduate version as well. Um, the, we call these surveys uh, instruments, another bit of weird jargon in the survey world. Uh, and the, the instruments um, have constructs within them that are on uh, the sub, some particular subject like organization. And there might be three, four, five questions about organization three, four, five questions about teaching and so forth. What we found is basically that um, there are all these questions and then there's one final question. Overall, how much did you, did you think your education was high quality? It's that kind of question. What we found is that um, there's a poor correlation between elements of the criticism and the overall satisfaction. And uh, what I wanted to use survey analysis, sentiment analysis on free text was to uh, to, to probe the, um, the relationship between the free text comments and then those um, constructs and finally overall satisfaction. It's a research project yet to be done. Political tendency is another big um, application of NLP these days. Um, there, there are many others, though. Uh, a really popular one these days is um, scraping the web, social media. It's, it's actually a, a cottage industry unto itself in uh, sociology and psychology. Um, now, <clears throat> use cases going forward. Um, there are some, the, the, the real research that's going on uh, either involves applying NLP tools to do something like um, gain insights from from survey subjects, or the uh, the hardcore research is developing methods uh, into NLP, and and even just just today, I don't know if you guys are on Twitter very much, but I tweeted out a couple of stories about NLP today, completely coincidental to to this. Um, and there's a there's a big thing that's about to happen in the NLP world. You probably have have even heard about it already. Microsoft funded a series of natural language processing tools called uh, the GPT models. G is the general processing something for for transformers. Transformers are a class of model that that. Um, categorize things by sequence, like language. And uh, the current GPT model is GPT-3. And what you do is, what it allows you to do is to um, provide some sort of context. And then the uh, GPT model um, creates um, contextually relevant text. And uh, the, the model is like for a chatbot, uh, where um, you know, you you may have encountered this online. It's very popular now uh, online, and all of the of the chatbots online are complete crap, uh, in my experience, and very unreliable and very unbelievable that they're humans. But um, and the, it's kind of like famously comically so. But uh, this is going to be a big deal in the future. The uh, next model, GPT-4, uh, is already the research papers are pouring out onto archive and it, it's it's amazing um you know the turing test of being able to uh 
discern whether or not you're you're talking to a robot. Well, um, the the claim the claim is that uh, we're very close. We're very close. So this is one of the big um, big applications. Um, chatbots. So the future of customer relations, possibly, dare I say it, the future of teaching. Auto generation of uh, of, of uh, text um, outside of outside of the chatbot uh, for let's say for artistic reasons, for um, for content on the web. Um, another thing I I saw uh, in the Nature News today. Was that uh, 40 papers were were retracted from um, Nature Geology, uh, and I think it was the Arabian version of the um, Nature Geology series for being gibberish. Um, it's quite a claim. 40 articles being retracted all at once, and uh, my guess on this story is that uh, this was actually an experiment by. Um, natural language processing users uh, who are a little bit naughty and who uh, generated some scientific papers on a model designed to generate scientific papers. They submitted them and they got accepted and then they got caught. So there are all sorts of uh, reasons for this. Content generation is, is going to be a big one. It's going to come into our lives and there'll be a lot of ethical debates about that soon. Language translation is um, also one of the really biggest um, applications too. And combining chatbots that um, take uh, contextual text, come up with a contextual textual response with language translation could mean that uh, someone could say uh, a word in one uh, a sentence or a, a phrase or even something bigger in one language it could be converted to text. That text could be um, responded to with an NLP uh, model, and then it could be converted to a different language with context. So it could transcend uh, communication barriers, even between Americans and the English. There are some caveats. Um, especially with what we can accomplish here. I've already rambled on a lot more than I wanted to, but um, this is a broad and a deep topic and there's bleeding edge active research. Um, and it's considered very hard to be an expert, but, but actually it's very easy to get into as we'll hopefully make some progress in the next two weeks or the next um, meetings that we have planned. So we have a different meeting next week, which I'll talk about at the end. Um, it's a thing where whole textbooks exist. Probably what we'll do in two weeks is we'll go and do a, a lab that, that I've done in our deep learning class that's on the subject of NL, NLP. And what we can get through today, if you practice it after today, you'll be well ready to, uh, to do that lab. And it's a bit more ambitious than what I decided to do today. New developments all the time, like GPT-4. It actually is very exciting. Even just in the minutes before this meeting, um, while Eric is in here, he and I were in a meeting talking about using uh, what what ecologists would call passive audio monitoring, but what essentially is NLP models for the detection and classification of bird species for the passive monitoring of biodiversity data. So that all sorts of new developments all the time in this field. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if I needed to um, actually import this. Let's have a look here. Marks on Python, gotten through here. We've done this. Um, let's see if we need that. We'll come back up here and remember that. I think that I meant to put that in its own code snippet. So, I'm going to cut that, pick a new snippet, boop, paste. I'll go ahead and run it just in case. <clears throat> OK, so now the data set, as I mentioned, it's a fairly chunky data set. It's um, we'll, we'll see how many uh, rows it has in a second, but it's it's well over 100,000 rows, 300 megabyte data set. It's called the um, Amazon find food data set. 
you can read about it on Kaggle. I'm not going to go there now. It's um, it's a um, data set that was published, you know, in an academic setting or maybe in an online setting for academic use. Uh, and the the flavor of it, as we'll see in a second, is that it's it's literally just harvested Amazon reviews with um, 10 data fields, which we'll look at in just a moment. Now I have uh, this set up, and if you've set up and run this in a similar fashion to me, you may be able to just run this without any setup on your own. But uh, we're just going to read in the data set. You can look down here. There's a little bit of information. It happens on CoLab and also on all the versions of Jupyter Lab. We can see what work is being done visually. Let's just uh, keep our eye down here and see what happens down here and how long it takes to read in this data set. Three, two, one. Busy, busy, busy. Busy, busy, and now it's idle, so we're finished. So it did take a few seconds to do that. If I just submit this so we can get a pretty view. In a moment, I'll print out the header for this table. I'm just going to close my email. So it's, um, let's keep rolling in. Emails. <clears throat> OK, um, we've got an ID, which is just the reference for the rows. We've got a product ID for Amazon. We've got the user ID. Um, that's displayed at the top of the review on the review page. We've got the account username also would be displayed on Amazon, so is putatively public um, information. We've got um, something that's called the uh, helpful helpfulness numerator. This is the number of users who said and clicked that they found the review helpful. And then we've got the helpfulness denominator. It's the number of total number of users who reviewed the product. So if you divide the helpfulness numerator by the helpfulness denominator, you'll get something like the percent usefulness of a particular review and for, for a wider analysis, if you wish. Um, we've got a star score. So for every particular review of every particular product, there was a star, one to five stars. No half stars are possible. There's time. Um, Matt may know what the time measure is here, but I think it's probably something like the number of seconds that have elapsed since some arbitrary year, like 1970, something like that. Yeah, that's the Unox, Unox Unix epoch. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy stuff. OK, summary is a text summary of the review. We'll just look at one in a second. And then um, the text, the difference between the summary and the text is um, is uh, the, the summary is just a few words, sum up just the essentials. And, and maybe it, it would distill the sentiment and the text review is the whole thing. Of course, we also have self-reporting of the sentiment in that star rating. So that kind of academic question that I was asking, it's often interesting to, um, even if it's only practically interesting to um, researchers, it often is because um, subjects that self-report are often unreliable. OK. Now, um, just by way of an example, now so, let, let's um, let's print these and then I'll come back up and we'll just look at one of the reviews. The shape of it is, um, yeah, there are more than I thought. There are more than half a million reviews, so um, 568,000 rows and uh, 10 columns. Now, I think in these, there are something like half that number of unique um, users and there's probably a big skew. You know, we could we could uh, explore that, but I'm not going to take our few remaining minutes. Let's just look at the data, the raw data, with the head function there. And if I back out just a little bit, it'll be too small for you to read, possibly. But I wanted to see the shape of the whole data set for the few first five rows. Um, so here we see the product ID, the user ID. Um, the profile name. Uh, this is a rounded. Oh, no, it's not. It's the count. Um, it's the raw count of the helpfulness numerator and the total reviews. So we kind of can get an idea that some of these are there are a lot of reviews and some there aren't. Um, <laughs> you know, in, in some cases, none. Nobody found it helpful and nobody else has reviewed it either. Uh, we have the score that was issued, the time and uh, the summary and the text. And if we just looked at, 
at one of them. I, I can't remember why I picked three in particular. I wasn't um, particularly interested in it, but if I just if I just bring that up, it's uh, it's taken us to uh, Amazon.com, and uh, this is a review of um, Turkish Delight uh, Hazelnut and Sultana uh, candy. <laughs> So, you know, you can trace it back if you wish to what the actual products are. So here, F11 back out and go back to my Jupyter lab. There we go. Oh, F11 back in. There we go. OK, so. Um, so, yeah, I'm just using plain old uh, plot here to um, count up with a histogram the uh, distribution of scores. I think somebody was asking a question from the EDA class in R, and uh, I had not realized this myself, even though I have used both of these both ways in R, the difference between um, bar plots and histograms and bar plots uh, in base R versus ggplot. And uh, they actually, they fundamentally work differently. I, bar plots tend to do some statistical analysis like uh, the mean, um, at least that's how researchers tend to use them. It's not a good way to use them because we prefer box plots, but um, but um, it's so easy to do in Python. It's even easier than in R uh, to do it. So what we see is that um, the vast majority of these reviews are um, are five star reviews, and then there's a much lower percentage of um, of uh, lower reviews and uh, there's this anomaly down here it's it's not um, striking but I wanted to say something about it because it's a known phenomenon in um, in star ratings I, I know this a little bit because it it uh, involved um, it involves some of the work I did on the national student survey which is also on a on a uh, five point uh, Likert scale, you know, similar to a, a five star rating scale. And uh, the phenomenon, the known phenomenon is that um, you often get more zeros than you would expect um, from a from a random uh, sample. So here we might expect a uh, if we were trying to measure preference, real preference for products, we might expect this uh, logarithmic um, pattern, but down here we get more negatives than we than we expect. And the explanation for that, uh, they have some kind of quippy name for it in advertising. I can't remember what it is. Uh, it's a delicious little word they have for it. I'll try to remember it, but um, what it is is that people that are pissed off will be more likely than average, more likely than random to put in their reviews. And uh, the same is is often not true for people that are um, that are really happy about something. So we tend to be uh, a particular population that gets sampled for these star reviews. Unless you're really irritated, then you're more likely than uh, than average to go and leave your star review. So I just noticed that in this data set too. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a workflow which I may give a a more detailed overview of next time when we come back for uh, for any sentiment analysis and any natural language processing. But I just wanted to get through a, just a real basic ones and make these remarks this first time. And next time, I think what I'll um, aim to do, it's two weeks from today that we'll do it. I'll aim to um, get the material out ahead so you can set yourself up so that we can um, all run it together then. And we should be able to use that one on CoLab. The data set for that one is um, all in the cloud. Um, but here's what the workflow is in a word. One is um, I mentioned that we need to figure out what stop words uh, that we need and, and turn it into data. Uh, I haven't talked anything about the processing of the data, and I'm not going to, but we will need to talk a lot more about processing of data, which is one of the complications of this kind of analysis um, next time. But here we're just going to go with the defaults. Now this is one of the places where I had trouble with my Python packages. Um, I had a script that did something like this that just didn't work. It just wouldn't work 
with the installation that I had. And um, but I found a solution for it. So we're going to what we're doing in this block is uh, creating from that natural language tool pack um, a stop words list that that we're actually going to download it on the fly and there'll be different versions um, of it. So the one that I'm getting is um, stop words, words in English. Uh, and we could we could um, get different versions of that. And we would want to if we had to. We also um, can add stop words. And what this little snippet is doing is it's adding using this update tool. It's adding a couple of ones and the BR and the href are um, phrases, character strings that you would see in um, web scrapes. So BR is the um, HTML code for a line break. It's used in formatting a lot, and href is um, uh, the formatting for a link in HTML. And we might, we might well want to add lots more to this. This is setting this part up as the absolute fiddliest part, and it's absolutely essential. You know what you're doing, and it um, it has to be done uh, in a in a customized way every single time, depending on the origin of your data set. Um, what else are we doing here? Then we're setting up some uh, word cloud tools. <clears throat> um, now this. Um, is removing the stop words from the word clouds, and it's uh, generating um, some graphical representation representation of the uh, the text that's left over from our um, from our removal of the of the words. Now this one is one I think it did work um, using using um, uh, matplotlib with different ways uh, different configurations to show and then to save uh, the uh, picture. This will take just a minute to run. I'm going to go ahead and run it and see if I have anything else to say. We can see Python's busy down here. Remember how big the data set is. So still thinking, still thinking. So didn't need to uh, it already. I think I had already updated Word clouds up above. Still thinking, still thinking. While while I'm thinking, um, does anyone, for example, Matt, do you know of a uh, little tool? Did I show you TikTok in R that counts the milliseconds that a process takes to run? Is there anything like that that you know of in Python that's easy to to do? Uh, yeah, there absolutely is. I'd need to Google it, but it's uh, very straightforward. You uh, you can do um time the time library yeah that's right uh and then you just do time now and it will just stick it onto your time now okay time now and then um whatever you x minus time now later will give you the TikTok seconds won't it yeah time and time now i'll just make a, a i've had the thought to do that several times and i've been either too busy or kind of like didn't want to stop my flow to google it Give me a good hint. There we go. <clears throat> now, um, <clears throat> there's our uh, our word cloud for this. Let's just make it a little bit bigger and see if we can see some of the words. Now, remember, this is this is a bit of a lame word cloud because we have um, we have um, we have uh, used the whole data set. We haven't made a distinction between. Um, Good ones and bad ones, but uh, you know one of the words that's the most common is uh, love and like and product. Product is an uninteresting one for sent um, sentiment, possibly, possibly. Um, these are food items, and you know some gourmet food items are the items that were the subset. So we're picking up um, taste, coffee make, you know, you've seen these things before. You can do a lot of customization to the word clouds, and I haven't tried to do that today. Um, now, with sentiment analysis, we would probably want to take a data set like this, and um, we want to simplify 
this as much as possible. And there's a practical reason for this, um, both with the data and with the information we want to glean from the data. Um, with the National Student Survey results, the common way that they're um, that they're divided is into three categories. So um, the questions are things like, um, um, do you feel you had great resources that were easy to obtain during your studies? And um, the question for the National Student Survey are, uh, you strongly disagree, so one, you disagree, so two, neutral, you agree, or you strongly agree, one through five. And uh, the way that we categorize those for sentiment is um, less than three is uh, negative or disagree, exactly three is neutral, and more than three is positive. Now here, they have taken even a simpler um, scheme in this example, it's stars, and uh, there's a positive sentiment, but it turns out there's actually a little bit of literature for these Likert scales that have an odd number of responses. It's all sorts of problems with Likert scale uh, as well. It's enough to make a um, statistician or a sociologist cry, I think. <clears throat> there's lots of problems with them, like the assumption that if it's that it is uh, an ordinal response and that there is an equal distance between the orders and lots of other assumptions that um, probably aren't true and probably aren't the same for every subject that you sample. But the phenomenon that is interesting for um, merely having a positive or negative um, response is the phenomenon of the um, zero sum game and neutrals. So uh, if you are a company and you want to increase um, or, or a university and you want to increase your standing, you have a couple of strategies. Um, you have a five point response to reduce down to positive, negative or neutral. Um, the, the national strategy in the UK is to uh, increase the positives. Um, but uh, if we just scroll up a little bit and we look at this graph, the uh, increasing the positive is, um, you know, fairly big, big target down here. Uh, but there's this this zero phenomenon impacts the strategy of um, of uh, increasing your positives. Uh, if most of your if most of your reviews are positive anyway, uh, another line of thinking says we shouldn't be increasing the positives because we're already mostly doing what people like. We should be working on removing the negatives. Um, the neutral thing throws in something very interesting. I'll only brush past this, but um, m maybe we should be working on converting the neutrals uh, rather than um, removing the negatives. It turns out that in the UK, the, uh, the Office for Students, they reckon that um, it's converting the neutrals to a positive that is the uh, that is the condoned strategy, and and they think that there will always be a few students that are unhappy and they can't be converted as easily as someone that's on the fence. Nevertheless, we're going to convert this and make a new data frame. Where am I going with this? I think this is pretty close to the end of of what I've got. Um, just dividing the um, data frame into um, numerical scores of um, plus one if it's a positive rating or negative one if it's a uh, negative rating. And then um, I didn't bother making new word clouds because I knew it would take a long time and um, made some new variables to, to positive and negative. Let's see if this works. It says it's not working. I didn't go back up and try to adapt that code. I tried to do something. Yeah, it's not working. So maybe that's a little bit of homework. Try to get this part working for next time. But I do have one final plot, uh, and it's here, and it's just to show when we um, simplify the um, data set down to just positive and negative that, um, yeah, what it looks like. So uh, we have uh, around a little less than 20% negatives. Um, so if you're a company, um, 
you know, what do we focus on? Increasing the good job or decreasing the uh, the uh, negatives? In essence, what we're going to do next time is uh, dig a little bit deeper in, into this and and actually build uh, a a deep learning model that analyzes statistically sequences of um, of uh, phrases and then look for a um, we essentially use binary regression. We we could use uh, multi um, nomial regression to come up with a statistical classification of um, of uh, sentiment analysis rather than this crude way. And, and ultimately, that's the value of deep learning. What we should see is that the uh, deep learning model will be a lot more accurate than these these crude methods. That's the whole name of the game. We're out of time. Comments, questions? Thank you very much, um, Ed. That was great. Iona, um, could I uh, could I ask you next time? Yeah. To just take five minutes and explain a research question that you would ask, and then we we can go through a, the uh, deep learning. Last time, I, I meant to carve out the time, and I just haven't had it to talk to you before this week, but. Um, what is a what kind of a sample size or what kind of web scraping endeavor are you interested in this? Yeah, um, one I could actually um, share with you. Um, there is a online forum called the Farming Forum, and so they have got like um, seventeen pages of discussions mm -hmm. about how good AHDB or oh, no, NFU is um, for the members. So there are 17 pages. And I was wondering whether we could use this Python to capture the 17 pages in one go and then do the analysis um, on categories rather than just uh, like you said, uh, positive and negative, um, but actually is a more deep learning categories of the comments. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, possibly. I, I think if it was 17 pages of stuff, I don't know how many, much text there would be, but we'd probably have Each to one would be similar to Amazon's um, uh, reviews. You know, one would be longer than that normally. Okay, okay. But the number of individual reviews is what I was thinking of. Oh, I see, there yeah. Hundreds or um, thousands or... Uh, no, no, I think it would be probably less than a hundred okay less than 100 so i think what we would have to do and maybe i'll think about this for the next two weeks is uh, we would have to um come up with an existing model that's made on a larger corpus and then um apply apply those individual cases and make a prediction about the sentiment from it so i'll try to come up with an example for that maybe if you could bring a few of them and maybe say for three minutes or five minutes at the beginning of the meeting in two weeks. Um, and let's just look at some of the data and bring three or five of them that we could push through a model. That would be fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I captured in PDF. Would that be helpful if I email you the PDF? Yeah, that would be fine. That would be fine. <laughs> that would be fine. Now next week, um, Prishmek has uh, has done some um, a simulation study for the ju justification of sample size. And uh, I haven't looked at the code yet, but I believe you're just going to uh, introduce that to us and we're going to chat about it next time. Uh, yes, Ed, um, I've got a question. How uh, much time should I fill with that? Because uh, is it or uh, is it going? Uh, it's not going to uh, be the whole uh, course, the whole uh, hour. <laughs> I think no, it won't be the whole hour, but I think um, <clears throat> I think it would be nice, I think, to tell people about your research for five minutes or something and to explain why you wanted to do it um, and, and the transects that you want to take. And then let us run the code and we can we can stress test it and talk about it. I'll, I'll have a look at it before then, too, so I can contribute. But uh, yeah, there's no 
you don't have to create content. We can. Um, we don't have to go to the last minute every time. Okay. All right. I'll be in touch with you, and I will make a short presentation. Um, okay. And we'll try to give some context around that because it's not the main uh, focus of my study, in fact. Uh, but uh, this uh, sampling procedure is something that has been used for for uh, how long is it, Magda? Eight years now or ten on a large march. And uh, I feel that nobody asked that question: how long the transects should be, and what sort of sensitivity we are getting uh, with the uh, transects that are say half a meter long. Um, so I think it will be quite interesting and maybe useful in several other studies. I think it's neat because um, I, I I don't think we've ever talked about the topic in here before. We have talked about using power analysis, the traditional may, method of doing that, but power analysis is very problematic for some experimental designs. And the alternative to it is simulation, which you've you know you came on to it without me ever mentioning it to you. So uh, it's very interesting, and it is the other main way that people do it. It's less common mm -hmm. than doing. Uh, plain old power analysis, but um, yeah, I think it's good. I think that context would be important for uh, to bring everybody along with us. All right, fine. So I uh, will be in touch before before we do, uh, start next time. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Don't 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 go crazy. You don't need to uh, do a lot of work for it. Thanks, All everyone. Right. Have yeah, a good thanks. night. See everyone next time. Ed, very much, Ed. Yes. Ed, just a quick one. Yeah. I don't know if after you've done the sentiment analysis in Python, I did a project on the sentiment analysis in R, mm -hmm. um, partly with Sparkly R, but I also did a lot on the API and downloading the, the, the content from Twitter on individual tweets. Yeah, I, I don't know if that would be useful afterwards as like a follow on that I don't mind doing. We certainly could do it. There, there's a real good book out on doing sentiment analysis in R. The, the reason I picked Python is just yeah, to have something a bit different. And also, Iona mentioned that Python specifically, but let's see how much, um, let's see how much, I'll definitely put you on the schedule for that because uh, that'll refresh me on what you did. And it's it's interesting to scrape those Twitters would be a thing to emphasize. But yeah, thank you. I'll put you down. Bro, thank you. There's a real good um, book on, it reminds me, I will next time make a little, um, little bibliography two weeks from now on NLP. There are a couple of popular textbooks just on how applied researchers use it, but there's one real popular one in R that's by um, Julia Silge, who's uh, kind of a big player and a, a very important person at, uh, she's an engineer at um, R Studio, and she wrote a book on NLP uh, a few years ago. So I'll, I'll bring I'll bring the citations and the picture of the cover to those. Okay, guys, have a good night. See you next time. Yeah, cheers, everybody. Thanks, Ed. I'm going to turn off the recording. There we go.